and I thought I would talk a little bit about how I became a writer. And I've got to say that, that I'm in need of a little encouragement today. Um, we've all had a hard year, haven't we? Yeah, we have. We have COVID. We're in, we're in the house. Um, we've lost family members and friends. I lost a, a dear high school friend in April and my aunt uh, to breast cancer in, in April as well and was not able to get back for funerals. And then we're missing the happy events too. Just yesterday, I was watching my niece graduate from Indiana University and watching it streaming online instead of being there able to celebrate with her. Um, luckily got that second jab. So, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, light at the end of the tunnel, but I'm hoping that in speaking to you guys and maybe giving, giving you a little bit of, of encouragement from my journey, um, you guys can encourage me in, in return because I think we all need that. Um, I'll, I'll just start by talking about um, how I became a writer, nothing special. I'm not one of those gung-ho journalism types whose fathers, fathers, fathers um, were, were journalists and, you know, you know, used a, a chisel and stone to, to, to hammer out, you know, things for, for the square in, in, in Rome or what have you. Um, I'm just a girl from Gary, Indiana, um, and nothing in my background really predisposes me uh, to become a writer or a journalist. My family came to Gary the way that so many Black families came to Gary. Um, they, they fled the Deep South. Um, as descendants of enslaved people. And my grandfather, for one, left Macomb, Mississippi, one step ahead of a lynching. And the job that, that he was looking for in the steel mill was not available in Youngstown, but it was available in Gary. So that is how my father's family came up. My mother's family is from Opelika, Alabama area. And similarly, they were moving north in the middle of the last century to, to find some freedom for themselves and find some new lives for themselves. And in doing, doing so, um, many of us were able to go to college. Growing up in Gary, um, I was lucky to have parents who were college educated and, and very much um, motivated by the Black Power Movement and everything that was going on in, in the 60s to ensure that my brother and I had the best education possible. And writing was always my thing. I, I just always instinctively understood how to put words together and was much better at putting those words together than I was at putting numbers together. But it took me a while to step into my actual purpose. I was one who, because I was one of the smart kids in school, they thought, you know, yeah, you'd be an engineer, be a doctor, um, be a lawyer, do all these things. And nobody really said, journalist except for um, one of the men around the corner who happened to be um, Harry Porterfield, um, who worked at, at that time at Channel 7 in Chicago. So he was our living, breathing um, broadcast journalist example, um, whose example I turned to when after going to Purdue University and, and it being revealed to me very clearly that I should not in any way become an engineer. No, indeed. If you thought levees broke in New Orleans, um, that, that was, was minimal compared to the damage that I would have done if someone had allowed me to, to enter their engineering firm. So, so yes, um, fled to Indiana University and, and graduated in December of 89 with a degree in journalism and music where I belonged. Um, most of um, most of my early time as a journalist was, was spent um, doing support, support things in the newsroom, like, like um, copy editing, wire editing. And um, I dabbled in some writing, mostly on a dare, I think, because newsrooms then, as they are now, are predominantly white. Um, there is philosophy that perhaps Black girls Black girls from Gary, areas like that, who had, that happened to be murder capitals and, and um, rife with all sorts of the urban ills that we've, described, we've um, seen in the, in the news. Um, there's an idea that maybe we, we aren't the best at articulating our stories. Maybe we can't hack it. So whenever I had a writing assignment, whether it was um, 
splitting time with the courts reporter and, and the cops reporter just to try out their beats. Um, I was on a mission to, to prove that Black girls do write and that I, in particular, uh, could definitely write. I, when I, I turned in 1A stories um, out of things that, that the usual reporters would have forgotten yeah. about. My first professional story was, was my first professional interview really was um, interviewing MC Hammer back in 1992, if anybody <laughs> remembers. And, and you know, it was the height of the parachute pants phase. He, he was everything. And, you know, he came to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I was like, I'm getting this interview, and I don't care what the, the lead music reporter is. The music reporter is like, you can't get this interview. I'm like, watch me get this interview. And I, I went to the concert and I sat there all night long till about five o'clock in the morning until this man finally had some time to talk to me. I had exactly one question, but I asked him and he's, he said, well, is, is that your only question? I'm like, yeah, that's the only question I need. You know, I've seen everything else. So I went back and proved that I could get that interview. Fast forwarding then a few, a few years later, once I kind of basked in the accomplishments I was able to do in, at, at Fort Wayne at age 23, I moved on to Dayton, to the Dayton Daily News. And I think that I can fairly say that this is when I really began to understand the power of words. I, as an, an editor there, um, I, I look with interest as um, friends and colleagues went to the Million Man March in 1995 and, and how powerfully they wrote about it and, and, and what they seemed to bring out of it for themselves. So when it came to the Million Woman March, October 25th, 1997, I decided that I was going to go to this march and I was going to write about this march. And even though no one in the newsroom, um, particularly our, our, our very heavily white male um, editing crew, no one really understood the purpose of it, why it was necessary. And I remember one, the executive editor asking, well, why is Michelle going to this? And one of my white male allies said, well, she's the one who knows the most about it. You know, she came to us and, and made a plan. So, you know, she's getting on a bus and going up 12 hours with the women from Dayton to Philadelphia to report on this. So that was lesson number one for me that if you know more about it than anybody else, then they have to let you go, right? proceeding until apprehended with that one. So I get on the bus and there are all these black women, you know, young women, old women, all walks of life. And, and they, they look at me in, in, and they're hesitating. They kind of have an eyebrow up because I represent the mainstream media, which does not um, ordinarily represent the concerns of, of black girls and women. But as we began to talk and as they began to understand me as a black woman like them from an area that, that wasn't all together, all that different from Dayton, Ohio, they began to open up and I began to understand how me sharing my little bits of my story could encourage other people to share theirs. And slowly they began to tell me things that would be useful for me to use to articulate where they were coming from through mainstream media and to tell their stories. I will never forget one woman who told me, this was back when, when there was lots more talk about HIV and AIDS than there is now. And her son had, had died. And as a mother, she had done everything that, that she could to, um, to help him and to guide him on the right path. And when he strayed to love him and to get him back on. So when, when he contracted, HIV and then ultimately AIDS and died, um, she, she felt that deeply in her heart that she had failed as a mother. And as she's reciting the story to me, she begins to cry a little bit. And it, it makes me tear up a little bit to go back. I hadn't thought about that for years and years until I thought about what to say to you today. And she's tearing up a little bit and she says, I need to go to this march because I need to bury my son. And just the power of that statement in knowing that it was a simple question, one black woman to another, not even a reporter to a person, but one black woman to another asking that um, was enough to draw this information out of her, something that's so deeply personal and hurtful to her, to draw that out and that she was willing to share with me so that I could share with other people. Um, I began to understand the power of writing and the power that I had in a position, no matter how small, uh, to be able to communicate. So I say that with the Million Woman March, that is when I became a writer. 
because no matter what else I wrote in that in that very long like like two day period, 2.1 million women from all over the nation, all over the world really, who gathered in Philadelphia, um, of everything that I wrote, and no matter whether it went to 1A or not, at one point I, I was standing, um, my, my computer equipment had failed, so I'm standing in the middle of the Philadelphia Inquirer newsroom, um, di literally dictating my story into, into the phone, like, you know, like you see in old movies, I literally did that, because, because I, could, I couldn't file it the way that I should, my com computer, and, and I felt that, that power and the, the ability to maybe change some people's minds through, through the words. So I took that with me, everything that, that I, I got, I can see clearly now 30 years um, later after I began this profession in 1990, I can see how everything that seemed maybe not to be as significant and maybe not, not to be as much of a point then. I mean, it was just one story, it was just one event, but everything I've been able to bring with me is what I can channel into projects like the one that we're getting ready to launch on Thursday. I want to tell you just a little bit about what happened after Million Woman March. I, I eventually decided that I needed to move the words into another atmosphere. So I came out to DC in, in late 1999 to work for Black Entertainment Television and subsequently I also worked for the Smithsonian as a, a PR specialist. And working at these very high profile places, it gave me an opportunity to write, but it also gave me an opportunity to, to once again um, experience people from, from highest to lowest, I say. Um, there was not MC Hammer, but there was better than MC Hammer at, at, at BET. I met Al Jarreau, who kissed me on the cheek upon finding out that, that he and I shared a birthday. And, and I was able to absorb how excited he was about releasing an album after what had been some years on hiatus and when, when he thought that perhaps he wasn't going to be able to continue on as, as a, a jazz and R&B artist. Miriam Makiba, oh my goodness, meeting the woman married to Stanley Carmichael, a, a, a civil rights figure in her own right in terms of South African apartheid. And just the many, many people that you can imagine come in the door, you know, every day at BET, we were like, oh, okay, Denzel's here again, whatever. You know, it just, it just got to, to that point. But I say that not to name drop as much as to say that in meeting these people um, of such names, I began to understand what was common to all of us. They too had stories and complicated stories. I mean, Miriam McKeever's story. Um, I was awestruck when I met her and got her autograph, but she had quite a story of just the hardship of trying to be an artist in South Africa and being in exile and married to Stokely Carmichael and literally not knowing what was going to happen to them after that. Um, so I, I learned that they are people and that it's just a matter of sitting and if you are honest and genuine, you allow them to be honest and genuine and perhaps break through some of the facades that um, famous people need to put up in order to protect themselves. So I brought that knowledge into me when I, when I say from highest to lowest, maybe I shouldn't characterize it as lowest, but when I got to the Smithsonian and was in charge of one, a particular exhibit on Langston Hughes, they had not done anything to bring in um, Black audiences at the National Postal Museum. So I saw an opportunity to do that. One of the people who came was Langston Hughes' teacher from one of the schools around DC. Um, and this is a person, you know, this is not Mary McKeeba, but this is somebody very significant that, that you should know that is living, breathing, walking in this museum, you know, has, it has taken the bus over to the museum just to absorb what we had on Langston Hughes. So I've been blessed in such a way to meet all these people from all these walks of life. The, the Columbine children came by, those who had survived the incident came to the Smithsonian Postal Museum one day when I was working and I was, was thrilled at being able to to see their story, how their story was one of survival. And so too are some of the stories that I had encountered. Now fast forward to you know, how I even ended up being at US Today in the first place, because it wasn't planned. And I would not have applied for a job if it had said be features editor at, at USA Today. It was just nothing. I never wanted to go back to newspapers um, af after Dayton. And, when I was laid off from the Smithsonian, I figured, well, I'll just go over and work, work with a friend of mine 
over at Gannett and USA Today and do a couple months and wait it out. And that was 18 years ago because they kept giving me things to do and kept giving me interesting stories and assignments. I was promoted to features editor. And again, I'm thinking, well, you know, this is the gig for me. This is all I wanted to do. Be features editor. We're going to talk about good food to eat. We're going to talk about some about the, the latest shoes and, and the colors that are, that are out. And, and that's going to be it. But there were other plans for what I needed to do. A very good friend came to me and said, said, you know, me and a videographer want to do this Black history section, um, but we don't have an editor. Nobody really wants to, to do it. Um, do you want to be our editor on a project? And I said, sure. And that project in 2006 was called Messages in the Music, where we did, did an eight-part series with some other reporters. So that launched me on the path to where I am now. That turned itself into a massive Civil Rights in America project in 2010, where I was asked to take everything that I had learned at all these various places and channel them into how USA Today is going to do projects. Um, and that was 2010. I've done several other projects since then. Um, the one that you all may or may have heard of, I'm sure you've heard of the New York Times' 1619 project. Um, we too had a project. I led USA Today's 1619 project. And in so doing, got to go to Angola to, to cover the story. We were there to talk about one woman, Wanda Tucker, who's family, she says, descends from two of the initial 20 and odd enslaved people um, on, on that first ship to Virginia. Um, my, my charge, I had become fascinated with another story. I'd been talking to lots of people who were able to articulate for me um, how, how they could, you know, what their story was. And, and here was a woman, Angela Jamestown, who could not articulate her story. Um, who the last anybody had heard or seen of her was in 1625. So when I went to Africa, I was assisting a living woman to tell her story and also assisting an ancestor to tell her story. And that was some of the best work and most fulfilling work that I've ever done. Um, some of the hardest work I've ever done. And for me, some of the most personal um, work to tell this enslaved woman's story. It took... Um, everything within me to sit and be able to, to write that and give voice to somebody who couldn't speak and to inhabit her experience as an enslaved woman and as somebody who would come through the middle passage um, for weeks and weeks. The ship is pirated. Now she's in a place that she hasn't the slightest idea how far she is from home and speaking a completely different language, completely different structure. Um, two years later, I'm still taking the information that I gathered there and, and how we put the stories together and channeling into that into telling the stories of more ancestors and telling the more, more stories of lost histories. So that brings me to the evolution of 1619, evolving me into a better writer, a better journalist, and I like to think a better person as well, and helping me, assisting me, showing me, as the ancestors do daily, how to continue to tell these stories and giving me a mission that's very different from anything that I thought that I would start out with. So if there's anything that um, I, I would hope um, as a takeaway that I can share with you is you never know what you're going to need and, and where the lessons are coming from or what, or, or what the lesson is. Um, but I've come to see that they are revealed to you over time and in ways that you don't expect. And um, I just like to encourage everybody to, to ponder all the ways in which things that have happened to you, um, a lot of things for the negative. Um, you can draw on later on and look back on and say, well, I see that I had to learn that in order to be where I am now and to be doing what I am.